I'm the president of the HBS Club of Toronto. We're delighted to host this session together with fellow Harvard and HBS clubs around the world, in Canada, in US, Europe, Asia, Middle East, Latin America. It's great to see so many folks uh, whose names I recognize. A pleasure to also welcome uh, club executives, officers, and members from a variety of clubs who are joining one of our sessions for the first time. We uh, are recording the session. So what we will be doing is we will be asking you to ask questions either in the chat or in the Q&A function throughout the discussion. Uh, please don't hold the questions uh, till the end, but do ask them. We'll do our very best to work them in into the conversation uh, as we go along. However, as a quick note, we also do the very best we can to name you when asking your question. And because the session is being recorded, that means that your name will be on the video. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, going to uh, be sure to leave some time for questions at the very end. So both during the discussion at, uh, and at the very end, both is absolutely fine and uh, please do participate in the conversation. Uh, I am delighted to welcome Thomas R. Eisenman, who is the Harvard H. Stevenson Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He is Peter O'Crisp Chair of Harvard Innovation Labs and Faculty Co-Chair of the HBS Rock Center for Entrepreneurship. The Harvard MS and MBA program and the Harvard College Technology Innovation Fellows Program. Professor Eisenman teaches the MBA elective entrepreneurial failure and the MS MBA core courses on technology venture immersion and launch lab. And also in recent years, he has served as chair of Harvard's MBA elective curriculum, the second year of the MBA program, and as a course head of the entrepreneurial manager taught to all 900 first year MBAs. Professor Eisenman received his doctorate in business administration, his MBA, and his BA from Harvard University. So it's veritas all the way through with uh, Professor Eisenman. And uh, prior to entering the HBS doctoral program, uh, Professor Eisenman spent 11 years as a management consultant at McKinsey Company, where he was the co-head of the media and entertainment practice. And he currently serves as a director of the board of Harvard Business Publishing. Needless to say, we're excited to welcome Professor Eisenman. Uh, welcome, Tom. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you about why startups fail. Um, thank you, Boris. Thank you for organizing and for leading the discussion. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, and, and thanks for your interest. Um, I see some former students uh, on the participant list. Um, Colt, you're out there, a couple of others, and even a former colleague, Talis. Um, uh, thanks for your interest. and, and uh, uh, hello to Toronto, hello to uh, all the folks from YPO, and, and, and hello to the rest of the world. Yes, yes, it's great, great for us to have you here. And like you said, a selection of, of alumni uh, from all over the world and diff different cohorts in different years. In terms of what uh, I've shared in your bio, it, uh, it looks like your uh, career thus far, your research has been just intimately linked with startups, entrepreneurship, uh, and also innovation. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, and I think it would be very interesting for our audience to know, how did that come to be? How did you become interested in these topics and in th those sectors? Uh, it's a long story. We could, you know, professors love to profess and talk, so I could spend the whole hour just uh, on the journey from, uh, from a management consultant working with big media companies to um, a professor teaching entrepreneurs and, and startups and so forth. Um, but the, the short version is um, uh, because I had done a lot of work as a consultant um, in the uh, early 90s when what turned into the World Wide Web was just taking shape, um, all of our clients um, across different practices, electronics, media, telecom, were starting to get interested in the same thing, the convergence of, of all those technologies. Um, and, and I developed some expertise. So when I got to business school um, there at a colleague who had built what really was the first course on, on e-commerce, uh, sort of using the internet to sell online at, at any leading business school and um, dazzling teacher, still uh, back, back at the school these days, Jeffrey Rayport, um, a, a lot of folks on, on the call will have had Jeffrey as an instructor. 
Um, he was filling the classroom up. This was 1998, um, and they needed somebody who was able and willing to teach the spillover. So given the background I had, I was a, a, a natural to come in and, and, uh, and teach the internet strategy course and took that course over. And of course, when you work on internet strategy, you do a lot of work on startups. And one thing led to another and, and uh, it became less about internet strategy and more about startup management. Well, that's, that's very interesting. And then, then that led to a course and another course and initiatives and programs and then, uh, and then ultimately to uh, this book, right? Yeah, Why that book. Um, exactly. And uh, what, what is uh, a new roadmap for entrepreneurial success? And in my view, an encyclopedia of uh, failures, success factors, how startups persevere. Um, I, I understand that this is also very interlinked with the course that you teach and the 20 or so cases that, that you cover there. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, we do have, the, we uh, offered it for the third time this year, um, a second year MBA elective called Entrepreneurial Failure. Uh, and so the course took shape right around the same time as I was writing the book. The book shaped the course and the course shaped the book. They co-evolved. It was um, fantastic to be able to test the frameworks and, and the failure patterns with students' lives, sort of bring the founders in. And, um, and see if it all hangs together. Uh, and, and then, uh, uh, so, the, so the book got better, but then the frameworks in the, as, you know, as the course evolved, um, it, working, going the deep dive of research you have to do to write a book, um, found its way back into the course. So worked so really well. Fantastic uh, yeah. collaborative effort effectively. Hmm? Yeah. And then when we're talking about failure, we're talking about risk. So what, what kinds of Types uh, and what types of flavors of risk, uh, Tom, do you normally think about in regards to startups? Yeah, so I mean, fa failure is a big topic, and you know, most of us fail at something or other um, every day. So um, we're talking about the big one here, uh, essentially um, organizational extinction. Um, um, al although it doesn't have to be that, um, but by the definition of failure in the research is, um, and, and Boris, you're an investor, so you'll appreciate this. Um, early investors did not or never will make money is the, is the definition we use. Um, but it, I mean, it's important to, so if you go back to professors love definitions, so you, you'll indulge me for a moment. Um, the dictionary definition of failure is something that falls short of expectations. And that begs the question, whose expectations and what expectations? And um, the, the whose point is very important because it's tempting to just focus on the goals of the entrepreneur and whether they've been met or not. Um, and, and, and an entrepreneur will have a lot of goals. You know, she, she might want to build personal wealth. There's independence. There's just putting something into the world that changes the world. And uh, it's possible to fail financially and meet some of those other goals. The, the reason we focus on financial returns is, is actually if you look at the lifespan of a, of a startup as a startup before it morphs eventually into an established corporation, if it survives long enough, um, you will, you'll see that only about 40% of startups are still led by the founder CEO at Series D, which uh, you know, might be five to seven years for typical startups. In the other 60% of the time, um, either by choice or uh, being forced by the board, the founder CEO has handed off the reins to a professional CEO. So there's still startups at that stage, late stage startups, and, and uh, they still can fail. But, you know, at that point, the founder's goals are off the radar. You know, now, now there's um, another, another set of parties. So I think uh, uh, investors, a, a good group to look at, I mean, you Got to be careful, though, because, you know, again, it's possible to have a positive financial return, but from a from a societal perspective, have a business that um, we all wish would just disappear. You know, we have plenty of, of ventures that pollute, that exacerbate income inequality, that coarsen democracy, that um, and um, the world would be better off without them. So, you know, we've got to allow for the possibility that some startups will fail financially and actually contribute to society, either by training people to go off and showing some entrepreneurs what not to do. There's actually value in that. 
um, training people um, to, to, um, to understand a function or an industry is valuable. The, uh, the book opens with a case study of, of, a, uh, of a startup called Jibo, um, which is a social robot that came out of the MIT Media Lab. And, and Cynthia Brazil, who is the founder and, and, and the principal investigator in that lab, um, for, for decades had dreamt of social robots in the home and a research focused on how to get robots to engage with the elderly and autistic children to, to sort of engage them intellectually, emotionally, and so forth. And um, uh, they couldn't sell that vision to venture capitalists. Jibo became, um, it, it's not a robot that moves. I mean, it moves uh, on a base um, in very expressive ways. Um, um, but it, 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 what's unique about it is it actually will initiate a conversation as opposed to Alexa, which will respond when you speak to it. Um, Jibo will, you'll come home from work and Jibo will ask you, hey, I told you the weather was going to be uh, rough, you know, were you okay? What was your commute okay? And, and tell you jokes and, and, and strike up a conversation. And, it's very um, interactive as a result. Totally interactive. And, and so Jibo failed, um, lost $75 million. So by the, the other definition, uh, definitely a failure, um, but serves as the design inspiration now for a whole generation of new social robots that are going into the elder care market. And, and so there's value in that. So anyway, um, like so many things, it's complicated. The other dimension, if you'll you know, allow me to just continue, is yeah, obviously there's some failures. Um, you know, we tend to think of failure as there's somebody to blame. And there are many startup failures where really you can't place the blame on the founder or, or the management team. You know, if you think of COVID and what it did to hundreds of thousands of, of hospitality businesses that just had to disappear because we all disappeared for two years. Um, no, no fault of the, of the entrepreneur in those cases. Um, and uh, uh, there are also la lastly a set of failures that that in the course we categorize in the book um, also as good failures. So a lot of the a lot of folks on the call will have heard of lean startup, um, the notion that you, you treat a venture like an, a, a science experiment, make some assumptions, hypotheses, and you test them rigorously um, without wasting um, any resources if you can. The notion of a minimum viable product. So if you get an it, right? Exactly. Uh, you get an entrepreneur who has a hypothesis and sometimes um, you run the test and um, turns out that your assumptions were wrong. Um, you didn't waste money on the test. You had to run the test to know one way or the other. Um, and sometimes there's no pivot um, that's possible from that point. It's a decisive failure of the test. That's a good failure. We should, as society and as investors um, and, and team members, we should celebrate those failures all day long. Um, and and you know, that should be the goal for an entrepreneur is if you're going to fail, make it a good failure or, 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 or have it a failure where it's an asteroid strike, you know, that kills all the dinosaurs that, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll feel sorry for you. It'll hurt still, but um, it won't be your fault. That, that's very interesting. And so how, how do people then transition their thinking to thinking that failure is a positive failure, failure is a learning? Um, that's very hard because we're wired up um, as humans to uh, defend our fragile um, and insecure egos. And, and so, um, uh, uh, and uh, that's at the tail end after you fail to actually sort of learn anything from it. The question is, um, will, you, will you take responsibility for your role in the failure? And sometimes it's not your fault, but, but often it is. You know, and, and the impulse of a lot of founders is going to be to blame others. It's, it's actually so fundamental in psychology. They, the psychologists have a name for it. It's called a fundamental attribution error. Anybody on the call who took Psych 101 in, in college will have heard about. And, and it's, it's very simply, if, if I make a mistake, I assume because I'm me and, and, and I have hold myself in high self-regard that um, it must have been somebody else's fault or external circumstances I couldn't control. But if you, Boris, make a mistake, I assume it was some shortfall in your skill or will. You know, you either weren't trying very hard or you didn't have the right capabilities. And so we blame others and we, we dodge responsibility ourselves. And that is hardwired in and it takes some discipline um, to avoid that conclusion. So a founder will say, you know, um, my co-founder um, lost interest. 
my investor pushed the wrong strategy, you know, pushed too hard. Well, you picked the co-founder as you picked the investor. So you, you do have some responsibility, even if other people share, share the blame. So that's at the front end, or excuse me, the back end after the failure. You know, at the front end, um, sort of, you do get to the question, some people avoid entrepreneurship because of a fear of failure. Um, it, it hurts um, and it does hurt. Um, and it is stigmatized, um, like it or not, um, even in Silicon Valley, where it's supposed, supposed to be um, okay. And in fact, you know, in theory, celebrated by some, it's, it's still, um, um, uh, unless you can explain very clearly why it failed and, 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 and what you'll do differently next time, um, pe people may not be as patient as we hope. But in many parts of the world, um, you know, for example, the bankruptcy laws are written so that an entrepreneur will be personally liable for, for the, for, for, and not sheltered by, 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 um, by bankruptcy laws. And there you, you have cultural stigma and you, you have um, the prospect of tremendous financial loss. So all of that can be a deterrent to people going into entrepreneurship. So um, what, what we find in the course, um, you know, one of the things I was worried about in building the, the entrepreneurship course in the MBA program is there's this blog uh, news site out there called Poets and Quants, which um, mm -hmm. reports on everything having to do with MBA programs all over the world. And, and I had a, um, a nightmare of, of five years from now, poets and quants writing this article that says um, rates of entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School have plummeted and uh, we can finally trace it to this course that they launched five years ago that- Talking um, about all the failure. Yeah, and scared, scared, away, all the, uh, scared away all the MBAs. Um, and so Boris, at the end of each semester, I. Ask, I pulled the students and I asked them, first I asked them, you know, when you came in here, um, what was the likelihood you were going to be an entrepreneur within the next 10 years? And obviously uh, with a group that self-selects into an elective like this, it's, it's a high fraction. And then I asked, has the course changed in any real way the likelihood that you'll be an entrepreneur in the next 10 years? And... Um, 40% say no change, but you've changed the way I think about, like, should I take money from venture capitalists? Because we see a lot of failed founders in the course who have reservations about having done that because of the hyper growth pressures. <clears throat> or I'm going to wait until I actually get really sure that I have an idea that's worth pursuing as opposed to just jumping in. Um, 20% say you've scared the devil out of me and um, you brought in all these failed founders. I can see it really hurts. Um, and uh, I don't think I wanna go through that. And the remaining 40% say you've scared the devil out of me, um, but I've looked at all these founders you brought in and they're really impressive people, number one. So I can see they did some things wrong, but they did a lot of things right. And they learned a lot. And um, they've all um, seemingly bounced back and are doing, and most of them are entrepreneurs again. Um, some of them have become venture capitalists. Everybody's doing something interesting. So I can see that there's life after failure and I can see what it feels like and what you need to go to, to learn from it and heal from it and so forth. And I think I'm wired up to do that. I think I can do that. So, so this 40% is actually more confident about pursuing an entrepreneurial path than when they started. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough stuff. Interesting. Well, it sounds like people, number one, they get more informed. They make more informed decisions as a result. So if they make more informed decisions, they're more likely to be successful, happy that, you know, they choose not to be entrepreneurs or proceed towards, towards that path, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, not being an entrepreneur um, because you saw um, what failure is like, to me, is a, that's a success, not a failure of the course. So, yeah. That's right. That makes perfect sense. And I actually remember a statistic from the book, about 52%, I believe, of entrepreneurs have, that have failed starting a business, is it within the next year or three years? And then um, the I, other I think we, gave them, we gave them three to the five, years, five years, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. It's, and and, and uh, that's borne out. Um, failed founders, I mean, serial founders are a thing. Um, and it turns out a lot of, I mean, if, if, um, uh, it, it's tricky to figure out rates of startup failure because you have to define a startup and you have to define what you mean by failure. But if we look at um, folks who've raised um, venture capital or you know money from serious angels, and, and if that's the base, 
Um, and if the definition is, did those investors get their money back, then something like two out of three um, are going to fail. And so if you look at serial entrepreneurs, you know, odds are pretty high that any, you know, anybody who's done three or four startups is going to have at least one failure in, in their portfolio. So, yeah. That makes sense. It's interesting that uh, as a result, there is just a greater number of attempts, greater number of possibilities to be successful. Uh, and then we talked about the attribution problem and whose fault is it when it is a failure. And hopefully yep. it's not stopping folks on one end, but on the other that uh, different parties will probably point at, uh, at the person sitting next to them. So is it the horse or is it the jockey in most cases, in your view, for success and also for failure? Uh, Boris, you're, you're a typical, investors love this horse and jockey thing. Um, yes. And uh, um, if you talk to, especially to early stage investors, they're going to tell you it's the jockey. If, if anybody hasn't, I can't believe there's anybody on the call that hasn't er heard this expression, but in case that's true, um, the jockey is the founder or the co-founders, plural, um, and the horse is the concept, the, the, the venture idea. And um, investors and entrepreneurs debate endlessly which is more important, um, which is more important to success and, and failure. Um, the um, research for the book suggests, and, and, and by the way, um, I, I would say probably four out of five investors, early stage investors will tell you they invest in the jockey, the, the founder, basically because number one, there's a lot of great ideas out there. So, um, you know, it's hard to find the tr truly, truly amazing, differentiated, great ideas and that um, ideas are malleable, right? Many entrepreneurs will pivot away pretty quickly from, from the initial concept to something based on market feedback, prototyping and so forth that fits better. So what you really need is a, a founder that can um, get that feedback quickly and adapt quickly and change. Um, so investors uh, tend to like founders. There are exceptions. Um, if you ask Paul Graham, the, um, the uh, founding partner of Y Combinator, he'll say, go for the concept. Um, if you ask Peter Thiel, who's a pretty good investor, um, he'll say, go for the concept and, and find something that can go from zero to one, by which he means um, one being a 100% market share, you, you know, basically the goal being uh, create a legal monopoly. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I would say that the failure patterns that we talk about in the book are almost all a blend of horse and jockey. They, they're intertwined in ways that are just hard to separate. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, ultimately, if you've got a flawed business model, um, a, a bad horse, a, a slow horse, if you will, um, it, you know, it is the founder who um, selects the business model. And, and, and so, I mean, if you take it down to root cause, it's pretty much always going to be some shortcoming of the founder. So I, I think that's why investors are, are probably on target, but it's complicated. Yeah, because it's all intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. And then I know that in terms of thinking about different sources of failure, you think about sources of failure at different stages of businesses yep. and also how everything is intertwined and it feels like where the business is getting started, how it's getting started, how the framework, the team, the product, how all of that is, uh, is being set up is probably at the root. And I know you think about uh, the failures at the launching stage. I was wondering if you could share with our audience a little bit about what kinds of major sources of failure you see there. Yeah, so the, the book is divided into three parts. Um, and, and, and the first is these early stage failure patterns. Um, what they are and, and importantly, how to avoid them, uh, how to anticipate, are you, are you likely to be vulnerable to this one? And if you are, what can you do to avoid it? Second part is late stage failure pattern, same thing, um, how to anticipate and avoid. And part three is if you do your best um, to avoid and you still fail, which is uh, frankly um, quite likely, um, you know, even if you avoid some obvious mistakes, it's just entrepreneurship is hard and, and, and they're going to be failures. So how do you fail well is the last part of the book. And so the early stage failure patterns, we can sort of think about them, the, the definition of entrepreneurship that many listeners will be, have been exposed to at Harvard Business School, Howard Stevenson's definition is the pursuit of opportunity um, 
um, without all the resources you need to, at least initially, to capture, to pursue the opportunity. So doing something new without resources is, um, is, is a surefire way to, to fail, right? Something new is by its nature risky and, and doing something risky without resources is even riskier. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the two important patterns you can look at here, I mean, the, the, the book focuses on ventures that at least initially um, are plausible, right? So show some promise. And um, an interesting failure pattern is the, if we focus on opportunity and resources, the two part of the definition, you can actually have the wrong opportunity, but the right resources. And by resources, I include the co-founders, the rest of the team, outside investors, and, and most entrepreneurs will have partners of some sort because other people may provide distribution or underlying technologies. And um, a very interesting pattern is where all of the resource providers are working well together. They're, they're, they've got the right skills. They've got the right attitude. Um, the investors are adding value. The partners are supportive. Um, but the team just never gets to the right opportunity. And they can even pivot and pivot and pivot toward a better opportunity, but they can't get there before the money runs out. And one of the, so, so think of that as wrong opportunity, right resources. Right. The pattern in the book, we label it a false start, um, just like track and field, for example, or, or racing, um, you know, where the athlete or the participant jumps the gun to get an edge. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are, are guilty of basically starting to build the product before they've really researched the problem and alternative solutions. And, um, it's such a classic entrepreneur behavior because what are entrepreneurs? They're people who get going, they make things happen, they get started. Uh, entrepreneurs who are engineers, which, and there are a lot out there, um, engineers love to build. So it couldn't be more natural to start the engineering work. Um, entrepreneurs who are not technical, um, and that includes a lot of, of our MBAs, um, hear over and over again, correctly, that you need great product to succeed as an entrepreneur. Uh, as an entrepreneur, How do you get great product? Do you have a great engineering team? How do you do that? You exercise the fantastic networking skills that, that MBAs have. Um, and once those on engineers are on board, you keep them busy um, building, which is what they do. So whether it's technical or non-technical, there's this strong bias to just get going, just do it. And the rhetoric of the lean startup movement actually encourages this fail fast, um, 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 fail early and often. Um, and what these founders have done that they, they are building minimum viable products, but they're doing so too quickly. There's actually a front, there's a set of steps to lean startup that precedes the, the building of the MVP, which Steve Blank, um, one of the lean startup gurus calls customer discovery. You know, go out before you start your engineering work, Talk to a lot of people who have the problem you think you want to solve and see if it really is a strong unmet need. Understand deeply what they're doing today because they're doing something to solve that problem today and what, what's, what are they satisfied and dissatisfied with in terms of existing solutions. And this work might take a month in, in, for a lot of entrepreneurs. It could take longer. Um, um, but um, a lot of entrepreneurs think they see the solution straight out, skip that work, take, let's call it four months in total to build the thing, launch the thing, run it long enough to see that it's not working and then figure out what to do next, pivot um, to, to a better solution, four months. And so their first version of the product is a failure. It's a false start. And they've wasted four months in order to save four weeks of you know skipping. And, and um, it's a bad trade, but it's a trade a lot of entrepreneurs make. This is probably the number one killer of early stage startups is skipping this upfront work. And um, it's, it's easy to convince yourself you don't need to do this work. Um, but if you've only got, if you're bootstrapping and you've only got a year's worth of capital um, in the bank, or if you've scraped together friends and family money and you've only got a, you know, to waste a third of your capital on a flawed first version of the product really increases your failure odds. So it makes a huge difference. Yeah. So that's one pattern. The, the uh, almost photo negative of this is um, you actually have found a great opportunity, the right opportunity, but you can't get the configuration of resources, the capital T team. 
And, um, and we have an example of that in the book where um, Perico founders launch an apparel business. They haven't worked in apparel. Um, two MBAs who can't decide which of them is going to be CEO um, because they've never worked in apparel. And there's a lot of technical steps in apparel design and manufacturing. They hire people from out of industry who've done those roles, but in big companies. And so they're not the kind of people who can come into a startup where everybody has to swarm, you know, help put out whatever fire is burning hottest. You know, the fabric sourcer says, I've never done quality control. I don't know how to do this. So right. they sit on their hands. Um, you know, the MBAs in this case, uh, form, you know, graduates made the mistake, like so many students from Harvard Business School just assume the only way if you're going to be an entrepreneur to be an entrepreneur is if you raise venture capital, because that's what so many HBS graduates do. Because um, they're going to be helpful. They, they've seen so many startups. They have yeah, the and, uh, and, and um, there's a reason why... Um, not many venture capitalists invest in apparel companies. Um, it, it's the kind of business you want to build. If there's a lot of working capital required. If you uh, design the wrong thing and it's not in fashion when you try to sell it six months later, uh, you can get stuck with um, a huge amount of inventory that you have to liquidate at a giant loss. More and of so, a private equity kind of a business, right, for developers. Exactly. Um, or even in, the, in this case, they should have taken money. Um, the third-party factories that make the thing, some of them are in the business of, of, of staking um, new entrepreneurs. And that's smart money that's patient, that knows the right pace to grow a thing, knows when it's working. And, and, uh, and so this company um, suffered from um, uh, their orders would get put at the back of the of the factory's queue if a big customer came in with a bigger order that needed to be expedited. So the wrong investors, the wrong partners, the wrong team, the wrong co-founders, we call this pattern bad bedfellows. Yes. So, and you're emphasizing that it's not just the founders, which is something that some people think about, some don't, but it's yeah. a bigger startup initial kind of put the fire into, uh, into Ex the Exactly. Idea. Now, you know, again, ultimately the founder made all those choices. So it is on them, you know, the fact that they picked the wrong investors, the fact that, that they didn't have the right relationship with their partners um, and they picked the wrong team members. So, you know, we can, we can pin it back on the founder or the jockey if we want, but it's it, the, the failure pattern is complicated. Usually, usually just a, a, a shortcoming of the founder alone. If you've got a great team, great partners, great investors, and a great idea, um, you know, somebody will figure out how to bring the talent onto the team to take advantage of all that. But in this case, a lot of stuff is out of whack. Yeah, and it also it feels that what we're talking about with Lean Startup being able to pivot. So in what you talked earlier with false starts is uh, they're not thinking about pivoting at the right time. They should have been thinking about pivoting earlier, right? Before they've made the investment. And here they're locking in some pieces that you're not able to pivot anymore, right? Once you've locked in your co-founder and your investors, yeah. stuff to change. Exactly. Um, um, I mean, once, so for example, if to get that partner to work, um, on your behalf to be supportive, you put them, um, you give them an equity stake, you know, now you've got a permanent partner on your cap table. Yeah. So the further along you get, the stickier things get and the harder it gets to, the more energy it takes to pivot. Um, Interesting. But then of course, the exciting challenges don't stop. Even if you have started and you found uh, a seminal group of, of customers, right? People that are excited about the product, uh, that might not still be the end of it at the launching phase, right? Because you talk about uh, you talk about the false positive problem as well, right, Tom? Yeah, that's the um, thanks, Boris. That's the that's the third early stage, th third out of three early stage failure patterns. And you know, we're all familiar with false negatives and false positives. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we've learned a lot about that. Entrepreneurs are subject to the same thing. You you can have a false negative where the entrepreneur will pull the plug on the business having received some signal that says the idea is just not going to work. And, you know, then they have the misfortune of 18 months later picking up a newspaper and sort of seeing somebody just did a SPAC for a half a billion dollars with exactly that idea. Um, uh, that hurts. Um, but false positives are much more common. And, and the um, challenge there is... Um, uh, so, so, so to be clear, a false positive is somehow the entrepreneur has been convinced by um, early signals from the marketplace that they've got a winning idea and they expand in that direction. 
but um, it, it turns out that the signal is a, is, is a false signal. It may in fact be strong demand, but the big issue we look at is, is differences in needs between early adopters and mainstream customers, the customers who are gonna come on board later. And so a good example is a lot of people on the call will be Dropbox users. Um, mm -hmm. The early adopters for Dropbox were software engineers who had um, very sophisticated needs for file management and file storage. You know, big files um, shared with lots of collaborators um, on many different devices. And the mainstream customer, Drew Houston, who is the founder, um, had in his mind creating something that was so simple to use, his mother could use it to store her recipes. And um, so that's a very different set of needs um, between the early adopters and the mainstream. Uh, Drew had the discipline to build for the mainstream betting correctly that what he was building would be good enough to, to um, bring the early adopters on board, even though he was leaving out a lot of features that they would have loved to have. That's not always the right way to do it. Um, sometimes you build for the early adopters and you slowly migrate the product toward the mainstream. Sometimes you build two versions of the product, one for you know pro version and a basic version. <laughs> so the point is for the entrepreneur, the way um, you must, must, and, and, um, and before I give you the, the solution, recognize what a serious problem is, is you need the early adopters. As an entrepreneur, if you don't bring the early adopters on board and sell to them, um, you don't have a business. So you should go after them. You should love them. You should listen to them. But you do have to be careful if their needs are different than the mainstream needs. And, and the key point is, again, when we're doing customer discovery, um, to study not only the needs of the early adopters who you're going to have to bring on board quickly, but also make sure you understand if those needs are echoed consistent with the needs of mainstream or whether the mainstream is somehow in important ways different and have a product strategy for responding to that. Um, Shaksham, I saw in chat asks, how do you avoid an endless stream of customer discovery? I just gave you another thing to do in customer discovery. So um, I, it, it's um, an art, not a science. When you start to hear the same things and when you've, when you've done enough interviews um, that you're not learning anything new and you're pretty sure you, you've filtered out false positives and false negatives, then, then you get on with it and build. Um, but um, if, you, um, if you aren't sure that you've found a strong unmet need and a differentiated defensible solution to that need, you should keep doing that discovery work. And, you know, and, and it can take weeks and weeks. I mean, uh, Shakshan, you, you know, to start building before you're sure you found a strong unmet need and you have a solution that's differentiated and defensible, that's a path to failure, right? If it's not differentiated, no one's going to be interested in it. If it's not defensible, it can be quickly copied. If it's not a strong unmet need, no one's, no one's going to take out their wallet and buy the thing. So sometimes it takes weeks and weeks, even months to figure that out. Sometimes you can do it in, in, in a couple of weeks, three, four weeks. Makes, makes perfect sense, Tom. And then Pankaj Kankar is asking, how can one differentiate and decide if it is false negative and one should persist versus if it's a wrong idea, not big enough opportunity? Um, false positive. Uh, well, the, 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 the big enough opportunity is, is a, a, another thing. I mean, I'd actually put that as a whole separate category of, of um, tests that the entrepreneur needs to run because you can find a strong unmet need, but um, to, to Pankaj's point, if it's um, for, for, for 17 customers, you know, each going to pay you $20 a piece, you, you don't have much of a business. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, um, um, the founder here does need to size the market. It's, it's a basic, every pitch deck is going to have that slide with a total addressable market. It's an important thing. And, and the thing to watch out for there in particular is every investor wants to see a billion dollar opportunity, right? You're not going to, you're not going to build a billion dollar business because you're not going to capture 100% market share unless you're uh, going to fulfill Peter Thiel's wishes. Um, but, um, that the key is um, to not, if you're gonna package up a slide that shows the billion dollars just to sell the investor, um, you, you, you better, um, if, if that's for marketing purposes, you, you better somewhere or somehow have a, a, have a really honest understanding of the total potential of the market. Because there are businesses out there that are just too small to justify the effort. 
And, and that's a super important thing to understand. And there are also some businesses that could be great owner managed businesses that are bootstrapped, but that won't get outside capital and certainly won't get VC capital, right, Tom? Yep, exactly. And, uh, and, and MBAs in particular um, um, should be aware of the trap of assuming that everything has to be backed by venture capital. Bootstrapping works, um, having a side hustle um, um, that'll help you sort of stretch out the bootstrapping works. Um, uh, Friends and family is a dangerous way to, a lot of entrepreneurs use it, but boy, Thanksgiving can be awkward. Um, you know, the problem with friends and family, of course, is um, they love you, um, uh, they may miss the money, and they really don't understand what kind of risk they're taking. You, you know, they, they have confidence and faith in you, and, and there's a two out of three chance you're going to shatter that confidence and, and, and have to live with the consequences for a long time. So I would encourage everybody on the call to be really careful with that one. Lots of issues with over-indexing, and here they are over-indexing their relationship and the personality, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's several questions that deal with some of nuances of early-stage failure, whether it's an early-stage failure from Peter Garcia Meza of how is it different depending on the industry, whether it's, let's say, medical devices or healthcare. Yeah. There's a question from Ali whether some of these dynamics change for impact investors. And then I, I'm curious, Tom, uh, is, is it more common, for, as an example, for scientific founders to have a false start because they're that much more excited about the technology and they come from a technical background? It works. It works in the physical world. Uh, but does it work yeah, for the customers? I'll, I'll take these, you um, know, uh, I'll, I'll throw out maybe three examples. So, um, uh, specific industry. So the book is light on B2B. Um, I would say that the failure patterns in the book apply 100% to B2B, even though the examples are mostly, I mean, frankly, I wanted to write a book that would be accessible to a lot of people. And it's just easier to talk about social robots and dog walking services and, 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 you know, dating sites and, and so forth. Uh, it's easier to relate to. Yeah. I wanted readers to be able to relate. The big difference on B2B, um, and it's important to keep on radar, is the choice, especially if you're selling into enterprise where, you, you know, let's imagine you've got something that is, is you're going to sell to insurance companies and there are 10 big ones and, and your startup is going to live or die based on your ability to get most of those 10 on board. Um, your first customer ends up being super important because um, uh, they're gonna be a reference to the others. The others are gonna pay a lot of attention. <laughs> and um, you can't, working so hard to get a beta site where you're gonna build and, and, and refine the software, um, it's very tempting to, um, th th that customer, that big first customer is gonna have a lot of leverage over you and can push you to customize your product in ways that you may regret later. Their needs may be idiosyncratic compared to the other big players in, in the enterprise space. And so you, you really have to choose that customer carefully, make sure you get a good, a good partner that's gonna let you um, use them as a reference, that's gonna uh, support your ability to, to learn in, in, in their organization. So that's one difference and, and, and a lot of B2B companies will mess that choice up. It's hard, it's a very hard choice to make well. Science-based businesses, um, you know, the example of medical device and so forth. Um, here, you know, if you look at software-based businesses, they very rarely fail because the, the, the team couldn't build the thing, right? Most of the time, it's true that if we've got a software solution in mind, the team can act. It may take longer than we expect, but, but usually you can build it. Um, with science-based business, it's often the case just the science doesn't work, right? You, you know, you were going to do a medical diagnostic and, and, and we thought that the, um, that, that the test would work and, and after the trials, it doesn't. So that's a very different failure pattern. Um, and it doesn't analyze all sorts of diseases from a tiny itsy bitsy drop of blood. Right? Drop of blood. Yeah, there's, uh, there's that. Um, the other thing with science-based businesses is it actually in, 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 um, many businesses, the flow of the logical flow of the customer discovery work is explore the problem space and then explore potential solutions. With a lot of science-based businesses, you have an inventor that's invented something, 
a material, you're at MIT and, and a professor of material science has got some lightweight thing that can be heated to a billion degrees and you know it'll be flexible and it won't bend and so forth. There'll be a whole bunch of applications for that material and the, the, the challenge for the entrepreneur, it's a little bit like the B2B customer, B2B venture picking the first right customer for the science-based entrepreneur, it's picking the right lead application. And you can, you can make a very big mistake there by getting the, the first application wrong. So that's a different failure mode. Um, Someone asked about impact investing. You know, if we, if we sort of broaden that to sort of the universe of not-for-profits, the failure modes for not-for-profits, uh, again, a lot of what's in the book applies, but I mean, there's a thing that's true for not-for-profits is they actually tend to not die. Um, they tend to be run by mission-driven people um, and, and um, backed by individual donors, high net worth individuals, family offices, foundations, and so forth. And um, it's often the case that those backers will dribble in just enough money to keep the thing going, even if it's struggling. The other thing that's true is a lot of the people that back not-for-profit ventures are, are donors who want to put their name on a thing. And it's not like we want one solution for education Right. And um, somebody's going to give all the money and put their name on it. There's going to be a lot of people that want to contribute. So you end up with a lot of organizations and they tend to be subscale um, in, in the not-for-profit arena. A lot of people working on poverty, a lot of work, people working on education, pick, pick the area, health, health issues. Um, so you have subscale organizations that last forever, but they are struggling in some way. So the whole definition of what do we mean by success or failure in the not-for-profit arena is, is quite different than the, the stuff I'm writing about in the book. And I think it's, it sounds like, in your view, it's similar to needing to define what are the objectives, what are the measures of success, and there's so much discussion about what they are in the impact space, and there isn't a clear answer yet, right? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my colleagues who study impact investing and, and uh, social enterprise have a lot of clear answers, but um, I'll, I'll defer to them on this one. It's, it's a really complicated space, and it's very, very different than... than uh, um, than for-profit ventures with a, with a commercial orientation. That makes sense, that makes sense. We're getting more questions on the full start. Uh, Lavinia Teodoresco is asking, what are your thoughts on the market research for social media apps? She's saying, I find it difficult to define an unmet need yeah. when it comes to social media. How would you say market research is done for these types of startups? Yeah, Who thanks Lavinia. Um, it, it, it goes to the core of, of um, when it's tricky to do customer discovery and, and even MVP, minimum viable product testing. So, I mean, if you think about the value proposition for a social network, for, for a social media venture, uh, it is the network. And um, uh, if, I'm, if I'm selling you an alarm clock, I can sort of hack together a prototype of alarm clock, show it to you and see if you like it. If I'm trying to see if you like my social network and I don't bring the network to you, um, I, I can describe it, you know, imagine all your friends come and they're doing this, or imagine they're these complete strangers that you do want to meet and, and they look like this, but until you've actually experienced it. And, and you know the relationship status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard to prototype something, um, you know, where the value comes from having a lot of customers if you don't have a lot of customers. So it's a really hard problem. And, you know, there's some smart people um, Andrew Chen, who's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, has just written the book Cold Start. He's got some great thoughts about, about how to do this, um, but it's a tough one. And what, what about uh, you build it, they will come. Mike Fegler yeah. is asking about the customer discovery and Henry Ford. If I asked the customer what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. Yeah. Um, if you Google deeply on that, you'll find out that 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 quote is um, might might have been made up. It's a great quote anyway, oh, okay. so we should okay. we should keep it. Um, and uh, um, uh, the um, the um, glib professor answer to that is uh, we should explore why they said a faster horse um, because it seems like the real underlying need is to get from point A to point B faster. Faster. So, um, so, so, um, yeah, you have to be careful showing any customer 
a product or a service they've never experienced before. And, and, and you know, they may find it difficult to, um, to give you reliable feedback on a thing they've never experienced. That's absolutely right. And I think that's at the core of the Ford quote. Um, but the reality is um, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, we've been going from point A to point B you know, since the dawn of time uh, in different ways. And, and so, um, so people do have a need to move and you can talk to them about why and when and what they do now and, and, and um, what are they unsatisfied with? If the horse is the best solution right now, what do they like and dislike about horses? Um, and, 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 you know, and then your entrepreneur has learned about strong unmet customer needs. That makes sense. And if their strong unmet customer needs, the customers haven't seen it yet, there's a chance they might need to bootstrap. And Sky Regan is asking what's the smartest way you've seen of bootstrapping? Ooh, um, I, I wish I could say I'm an expert on this. Um, we, um, because in the, in the MBA course, um, we have a parade of failed founders coming in and saying one after the other, um, not all of them, but many of them, um, I took venture capital. I knew what I was doing. Um, I knew in the abstract that the way a venture capitalist wins is if they have a small share of big, big, big winners in their portfolio, 20 fold returns on the original investment and, and a lot of, of ventures that um, either lose money or don't make much money. Um, and that, that that business model leads venture capitalists to push every entrepreneur in the, in the portfolio to, if you'll allow me a baseball metaphor, swing for the fences, you know, tr try to be big, grow fast. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I knew that in, in the abstract intellectually, but I hadn't experienced it as a founder. And when you experience that pressure for hyper growth, it's a different thing than, you know, and, and an entrepreneur doesn't have a portfolio. They have one shot. Um, and, and, uh, and some businesses like the apparel business I was talking about before are better built slowly before you speed the thing up um, and, and shouldn't be venture back. So because we got that message, you know, the students kept pressing us, well, okay, so show us other ways to fund, show us bootstrapping. And, and so this year um, we've got a couple of cases in the course um, with bootstrappers. And um, I guess the best thing to this question that we learned is there's a lot of magic in a side hustle. It, you know, the, the, this, this founder is building a, a cold drip coffee business and she learned that she's a smart MBA who can, um, uh, with a lot of skills uh, related to what she was doing before she, she, she did her graduate work, um, she can hire herself out as a consultant in 10 hours a week, make a lot of money. And she was really been able to stretch the runway of the thing out, um, you know, and still well, have financially enough. and time wise, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so that's uh, that's probably the biggest single. Um, there's a um, there's a, an alum of the school. Um, oh gosh, I'm, I'm I'm embarrassed. I'm going to uh, I'm going to blank on his name. I'll I'll see if I can pull up the Amazon really quickly. Patrick McGinnis. Um, oh, has written a book called the 10% uh, Entrepreneur Tom. 10%. Do you, do you know it, Boris? Uh, I know the book and I know Patrick. He's great. Yeah. So Patrick, everybody listening will, will love this. Um, he actually was the person who coined the expression FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, Fear of Missing Out. That's right. And um, his podcast, uh, I talked about the book on his podcast is called uh, FOMO Sapiens. Um, and um, Patrick's written an entire book. The 10% Entrepreneur is all about ways to bootstrap, um, ways to build a new venture without committing yourself 80 hours a week, um, you know, for, for months at a time. So, so that's a good thing to look at. And that, and that, and that makes sense. And actually, like you mentioned, he has the 10% entrepreneur, and then he has a, a book on FOMO specifically as well, and how he ties it into, into yeah. opportunities. Uh, in terms of the VCs, and maybe peer pressure, societal pressure to make it huge, to go for moonshots. Uh, Elon Musk with, uh, with all of his successes and, and controversies, Twitter, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, what do you think about moonshots uh, and, and sort of success failure in those big, big, big yeah, uh, um, ideas? I, I, I don't know if the percentage failure rate when people take that path is higher. I suspect it is. Um, 
there, there's actually a failure pattern. The second part of the book I mentioned is late stage failure patterns. And one of the patterns we, we talk about, we call it cascading miracles. And, and the notion here, if you think of a mathematical expression, you're gonna multiply a bunch of things together. And if any of those things is zero, the whole expression goes to zero. So, so think of a venture where a whole bunch of things have to go right. And each of those things is a big deal, really um, demanding. So a fundamental change in customer behavior, you know, the, 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 not, not a faster horse, but a, you know, a car. Um, uh, lots of capital, changes in government regulation. Um, and you um, need different roads. Yeah, exactly. Um, you need incumbents uh, to come along and partner with you. You know, so sometimes these moonshots work. Uh, Tesla worked, uh, or at least it has so far. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a, you know, it's an astonishing um, last quarter profit um, tally. Uh, and SpaceX, likewise. So Musk seems to be good at launching moonshots that work. But right. um, and Federal Express, if we go back 50 years, was the biggest, um, the biggest venture capital back business in American history at the time launched. Well, nobody seven. thought Fred Smith could do it, right, Tom? Uh, crazy. I mean, send a package from Cleveland to Buffalo by sending it through Nashville, Tennessee, um, you, you know, overnight delivery. Um, it was uh, conceived of as being nuts to, 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 to dedicate planes. Right At that point, um, packages, if they flew at all, um, went in the belly of a, of a passenger plane going from Buffalo to Cleveland directly. Um, and, uh, um, but, um, it's often the case that it's just a bridge too far that, that one of the, so the, the case in the book is a better place, which raised $900 million trying to blanket the planet with charging stations for electric vehicles, um, including, um, robotic stations that would a robot would pull a depleted battery out of your car and in five minutes sort of pop in a new one, um, and they launched this in Israel and Denmark, um, and um, it, it just it was too soon, um, too big a behavioral change, uh, too hard to get the OEMs, the car makers, to um, adapt their designs, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, and, and ultimately too much capital. So, uh, yeah, the um, you, you didn't get the cascade of miracles there, which 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 is too bad, and. Uh... Hopefully, hopefully something that's as impactful for the planet will happen. But sometimes there's it's not not the right place, not the right time, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you very much for this insightful discussion. Thank you for walking us through some of the some of the reasons for startup failure. There's uh, many others in the why startups fail, uh, and I'm putting in the the link to the to the book on Amazon into the chat. Uh, we've talked a bit about the failure uh, in the launching stage. There's many more in, uh, that you describe in the scaling phase and also strategies, tactics, frameworks, right? The square and the diamond, there's lots there. Uh, thank you again for this discussion. Uh, huge pleasure. And uh, I'm glad that folks were able to join and participate. Yeah, Boris, thank you for this. And thanks everybody for listening. Uh, the, one, the one parting thought I'd have for you is we didn't spend any time at all on how to fail well as a founder. If, if you have to shut down the venture um, and uh, would encourage you um, either to find, find that part of the book and read it if, if you think you might be on, a, on the entrepreneurial path someday or um, find a founder who's been through it. Um, any investor in startups will have been through it many times. Find somebody thoughtful who can coach you on how to heal um, it's, 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 it's a skill that you can pick up, how to learn from the experience and how to position yourself for what comes next in ways that um, have preserved your relationships, your reputation, your integrity, and so forth. So um, thank you very much. Pleasure. And thank you very much, Tom.